Uh, so hi, uh, as mentioned, I'm Steven. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Samsara, uh, and today I'm excited to talk a little bit about our live query architecture and uh, some of the lessons that we've learned using it in production. So first, a little bit about Samsara. Um, we are a hardware and software uh, sensor platform company. And so what that means is we build hardware devices, like ones that might uh, plug into your, uh, your car or your truck. Uh, and we send that sort of telemetry data up to a software dashboard that we have uh, so that uh, fleet managers or operations managers can go and uh, use that data, analyze that data uh, for, for their business. Uh, so this is a great marketing page that I pulled out for our website. Um, but it, it kind of highlights the different types of things that you might use with our platform and like, uh, kind of highlights why live, uh, live data is necessary for, for our purpose. Uh, so here, for instance, we have a page that's tracking a lot of different vehicles. Um, if we had a temperature sensor in the back of a truck, we might want to know uh, the temperature of that food so that, uh, or rather, if we're tracking food, we might want to know the temperature of it so that we know that the food is safe to eat. Uh, if we had a dash cam connected to it, then we'd want to see the latest uh, images from the dash cam so that we can see what the driver is seeing. So there's a whole bunch of different data that uh, we might pull out of our system we want to show to our users. And importantly, a lot of this data has to be live. Uh, for this to be useful for fleet managers to use in the field, they want to be able to see uh, what the latest status of their fleet looks like. Uh, so let's look through an example of, of kind of a very basic feature that we might find in our system. Uh, let's say we want to show some of our vehicles on a map. Uh, and so we might run a pretty simple query that looks like this, where uh, we're fetching all of our, uh, our vehicles, grabbing their, loca lo their location. Maybe we want to see uh, their speed and like the latest image that they're showing as well. Uh, so uh, we also want to keep this data live. So like, wh what are the different ways we could think of? The simplest thing might be to just uh, periodically pull the server for uh, what the current state is. So every five seconds, we send a query to the server. Uh, we get the latest state. That's great. So this is pretty reasonable, except uh, we might, like, it's not super efficient. We might end up sending a lot more data than we actually need to. Um, if we look at this query, uh, I added a couple extra fields here. So uh, the idea of the vehicle, the name, uh, maybe we want to also show the make and the model of the vehicle. And this stuff almost never changes. So like, maybe we don't actually want that to be uh, sent over the wire every single time we're re-executing this query. Uh, if you think about a more degenerate case, if we had 1,000 vehicles, then uh, let's say we're looking at this page during off hours, so maybe only one or two are moving. We'd still be computing the location for all those vehicles and sending that entire payload over the wire every five seconds, even though we don't really need it. So what's a better solution look like? Uh, one of the things that's uh, currently in the, the GraphQL spec is subscriptions. So this is kind of the model where we ask the system, tell me when interesting things happen, and I'll figure out how to update myself. <coughs> So uh, in a subscription-based model, we might still have our query. And then on top of that, we'll specify a subscription for, uh, in this case, uh, the vehicle location's changing. And so now I have a subscription called vehicle location changed. I tell it what uh, vehicle IDs I care about, and then I get uh, the response back when that actually happens. In our system, uh, again, we're still uh, sending our query over maybe HTTP or potentially a WebSocket. Uh, and then we're also registering the subscription uh, over the web, uh, a new WebSocket as well. And the reason why we want a WebSocket is because uh, these events are being pushed from the server, not being uh, sort of pulled by the client. On the server, we also uh, add some complexity where uh, we now need some sort of pub-sub mechanism. So uh, the data, the, uh, we need to be able to publish events uh, f that are happening in the system and then uh, expose some method for uh, the, graph the GraphQL client to uh, subscribe to them. Uh, and so uh, finally, we also need to take our data source and then start instrumenting it. So whenever we see new writes, uh, the, maybe the device is sending its new location updates, uh, we need to instrument that code so that it's also publishing the new event for uh, the location data actually changing. Stepping back a little bit, we can kind of look at where the responsibility lies uh, in, the, in this diagram. So on the client side, uh, the client needs to ask sort of what data do I need uh, to, to render this view? But now it's also in charge of uh, trying to understand how can that data change? So it you know, registers whatever subscriptions it needs. And on the server side, again, we have, uh, as usual, what kind of data can you query? And then also we, we sort of need to expose the different types of events that, that might exist. So this is kind of interesting because now the client has to think about some new, uh, new sort of state. It needs to understand uh, like what events might I care about? 
In our current example, we just have this one subscription, uh, so for the vehicle location changing. But you can imagine that we might be interested in uh, seeing reactivity or seeing live updates for all different parts of our query. So maybe we care about when the speed changes, or we care about uh, when the dash cam receives new images. Um, all of these things, we'd have to instrument some sort of event so that the client can uh, subscribe to it. One way around this, uh, we might decide to, instead of having very fine-grained events, uh, have just like one big event that is about uh, this query specifically. So vehicle map data change, uh, anytime any of the fields on this query changes, we just send this one big event uh, to, to the front end. So there's this kind of tension where we have to like design these events pretty carefully, and we could go very fine-grained where uh, there are a lot of different sort of specific events that are uh, about different parts of the query. And this, is, this gets kind of complicated because then the front end has to be aware of all the different possible uh, types it might care about. If uh, you add a new field to the front end query, uh, rather, if you add a new type of reactivity in the back end, then the front end now has to go make sure to register for that event as well. And the, on the other side of the spectrum, you might decide to do very coarse grained events. So like maybe the data for this, this vehicle change, or maybe data for anything in this organization, like any of the vehicles changed, uh, we might show events for that. That can also be problematic because then that would mean that if you ever change the front end query, the uh, vehicle map data change subscription also needs to change. Or in the worst case, if you have a uh, subscription that is too coarse grained, you might be getting updates for events that aren't even relevant for your query. So let's take a look at, um, I've talked a lot about what subscriptions look like, uh, but, but this, this talk is about live queries, so let's talk about that instead. So with a live query, uh, instead of, uh, we, we have our query just as before, but now we no longer have a subscription. And so we take our model uh, that we were previously looking at, we pull the subscription out, and now instead all of our queries are being sent over this WebSocket interface. <coughs> Additionally, the server now uh, has to start sort of keeping track of what live queries uh, the, what live queries the client is subscribed to. So now we are sort of explicitly switching from a stateless service to a stateful service. Uh, the GraphQL server explicitly knows about all the different kinds of live queries uh, that the client is currently subscribed to. Uh, and notably, as the server goes and executes these different queries, it keeps track of uh, the different subscriptions or the different sort of live data pieces uh, that are happening behind the scenes on behalf of the client. Uh, and then over here, we sort of have our existing data and pub sub mechanism, but now I've drawn a scary looking box that says reactive data store around that. Uh, and the, the scare quotes are there intentionally because I think this, uh, this term sort of li uh, reactive data store is kind of difficult to understand and it can be a kind of magical feeling, but uh, we'll talk about what this actually looks like uh, under the hood. So reactive data store is really just a way of saying like how does uh, how does how do changes to the data affect the different queries that I might be interested in? And so uh, the way we sort of approach this is that whenever we're executing different parts of the GraphQL query, uh, those fetches to different data sources, to different microservices, uh, register their data dependencies during the execution of the query itself. Uh, so let's look at an example, sort of concretely, what does this actually look like? Uh, going back to our vehicle map query example, um, let's say we're executing our query, we get down to the location field uh, that, that we've selected. When we execute this field, uh, we go in, let's say, uh, to get the location data, we actually go do an RPC out to some other service that's holding on to this, uh, this data. At the same time, on the server side, we have enough information to build a subscription on behalf of the client. So as we fetch the current location for the device, we also know enough to uh, write a subscription out and ask the, the other service to sort of update us whenever changes occur. And so uh, getting, uh, coming back from this, ex uh, this execution, we, uh, we get back uh, both the current location point but also a subscription handler that we can register with the executor. So now we're telling the executor uh, specifically, here is a data dependency for the location field. Um, I care about vehicle location change events. Let's say later on, the hardware device that we're tracking or that we're looking at uh, on, our, on our view uh, gets a new, uh, live, uh, rather gets a new location point uh, sent to it. Uh, an event gets published onto our PubSub uh, our PubSub mechanism, and then our subscription gets gets called. So here we're sort of invalidating this part of the query specifically. 
Um, once this happens, we're able to do a recomputation, and so we go and uh, essentially re-execute this field. And so we do our RPC again, and then we get back the latest data point. Notably, the other parts of the query are not recomputed. We don't need to do any of that work again because we know uh, that like, none of our pub sub mechanisms have told us that this data has changed. So there's no reason to go throw away the work we've already done. And this is part of why the server sort of has to be stateful because it needs to know what it's already computed, what it's already told the client so it doesn't need to repeat itself. Uh, and then finally, the last step to this is uh, we need to send the new update up to the client. So we'll send a, a small diff over the, the WebSocket connection. And the way this works is, again, we've uh, stored the state of what we've already told the client. And so we'll do a small JSON diff uh, against these two payloads, and then we'll send the result patch over to the client. So the client now can take that patch, apply it onto its current state, and it now understands uh, the, the newest state of the world. So that's more or less what, what reactive data sources really are. They're this pattern of uh, fetching data and then subscribing to live as uh, sort of subscribing to relevant events uh, while you're doing that. And then uh, the rest of it is just kind of like doing this validation mechanism where we know different parts of the query are no longer up to date. And then finally recomputing those parts of the queries and then sending uh, the new changes up to the front end. So this is kind of interesting because it's a pretty generic pattern for uh, how you might want to do this sort of pub-sub mechanism, and it can really be applied to any sort of data source. And so you can imagine that uh, you probably don't want to actually go manually instrument the pub-sub for any type of read or write that you have in the system. Uh, and so what we've done is we have uh, some mechanisms um, for our more common data sources where you don't actually have to go write the pub-sub uh, manually yourself. So for instance, our MySQL client is instrumented such that uh, when you execute queries against MySQL, uh, we keep track of uh, those outstanding queries and then we're able to watch for changes to the MySQL database that might be relevant to the queries you're interested in. So that happens automatically. Uh, folks that are writing product code don't really need to think about this. So what's the effect that we have um, on our system now? Uh, let, let's like, take, take a step back and kind of look at the architecture again. This is kind of nice. Um, if we look at what the client is uh, responsible for, it now only needs to specify sort of what data do I care about now. Um, contrast, uh, in contrast to sort of the subscription model where we had to uh, also get the client to think about how can the data change, uh, that responsibility is kind of conspicuously missing from, from this diagram now. And the reason for that is because that responsibility is now sort of shared between the different parts of the server. So. Uh, the sort of like, how do we know uh, what data the client needs to know about that, that might change is uh, kind of shared between the reactive data source and the state, uh, the sort of copy of the state that the server is holding on to. So this, uh, you know, clearly has some implications and trade-offs for how you sort of think about the system and like how you're actually writing some of your GraphQL queries uh, in the first place. One of the sort of immediate ones that you might uh, sort of react to when you hear like, oh, you have a stateful server, is that like actually state is pretty hard. Um, you can imagine that if uh, a client, or rather if the server uh, gets redeployed or it has to restart for whatever reason, then you lose all the state uh, for like what the clients connected to that server cared about. Uh, in our current system, we uh, just like redo the, the queries that the client uh, was interested in, uh, but with a different service, so it's not super satisfying. You end up doing a lot of extra work, uh, e even if you don't really need it. Another issue is that perform this, this sort of like complicates your performance problem even more. I think we've mentioned in a few, a few of the different talks that uh, performance can be kind of tricky to understand with GraphQL. Um, if you're a backend engineer and you want to understand like, oh, you know, you have a resolver, how's it actually executing things? Uh, it's not super clear when you're actually writing your queries. Live queries exacerbate this problem a little bit because now not only do you not know necessarily like how expensive a field is, but you also don't know how often it might be recomputing. So uh, our sort of location change event, for instance, if that's happening, happening every second or happening every five seconds, that might actually be a considerably expensive thing to like happen to put into your query. So you have to be sort of cognizant of that. Uh, we've ended up spending a non-trivial amount of time kind of instrumenting the back end and understanding like how often are RPCs happening, how often are computations happening, so that we can sort of grasp how the system is doing and, and better understand like, what our load ends up actually looking like. It's also worth noting that th this abstraction kind of 
goes both ways here. Uh, most of the time, you don't really need to think about the uh, sort of live update mechanism. In contrast to subscriptions where you know, you're, you're writing a front end component, and not only do you have to write the query, but you have to write uh, your subscription for it. Uh, with live queries, you, you typically don't need to think about it. But the flip side of it is that uh, at some point, you might need to think about it, and then you really need to think about it. Uh, and so an example of this is like, let's say that you have a query outstanding, and then you run some mutations against your service. You expect the query to update, but you wait five or 10 seconds, and nothing happens. It can be really hard to understand why uh, invalidations or recomputations aren't occurring, because you, know, you have to sort of observe something that's not happening. So peeling things back can be kind of tricky, and, and maybe even necessary. Uh, for, for more complicated situations. On the flip side, there are a lot of really nice things that we get out of the system. Uh, one is that we now have really well-defined update paths for any sort of, uh, any sort of change in, this, in the system. So live queries are kind of like now the norm, not the exception. If you need to build something and it needs to update every you know, minute or five minutes or 30 seconds or whatever it is, it's kind of the default in our system. And it's allowed our product engineers to build some uh, types of features really, really quickly. Uh, so for instance, we built a messaging service, and we also built uh, a feature around uh, tracking real-time deliveries uh, for uh, tracking real-time deliveries on like a map. And those features, we didn't really have to deliberate about the design for that, uh, at least with respect to sort of the liveness of it, because it's just kind of something that our product engineers know how to do, and they understand the patterns uh, for how that's supposed to work. And uh, it also simplifies our read paths. So you don't really have to think about, uh, like, uh, the, the whole point of this is kind of like the, the queries update by themselves. And so you don't really have to think about uh, how you might get changes to reapply into your system. And so if you run a mutation uh, sort of in a non-live uh, GraphQL setup, you might imagine that you have some return type and it returns you hopefully as much information as you need to know to like update the current state of the client. Uh, same thing with subscriptions, you have some return type and it, you, you apply that to your local state or you do some other, uh, you do some other operations to, like get your client up to date. Uh, whereas with live queries, you don't really need to think about that at all. It, it sort of just happens. So overall, we think that live queries are a really powerful default for uh, sort of doing really fast, easy product uh, engineering. And we're excited uh, for more folks to try them out as well. Uh, finally, our, uh, our GraphQL Go uh, live query uh, implementation is open source. It's called Thunder. Uh, so if you're sort of interested in checking out what the code actually looks like for this, uh, feel free to check it out and let me know how it goes uh, if, you, if you do try it. And then uh, feel free to find me on Twitter or shoot me an email if you want to talk about this more. I'm always excited to talk about live queries in GraphQL. Thanks. <laughs>